McGuire's welcomes you to the car craziest half hour on television. Join us now as we mix it up with serious car enthusiasts from all walks of life, across America and around the world, and discover why so many of us have become car crazy. It's about the hood. However you describe your passion for cars, it transcends all geographic, economic, ethnic, age, and gender barriers. Car Crazy is your emotional connection with car lovers all over the world, who you have nothing in common with except for this unexplainable passion for cars that every car enthusiast understands and feels to their very core. It's been called a contagious disease, and we want you to catch the bug, <laughs> if you haven't already. Well, the first time at the lakes was with the little belly tank with the V860 in it. I was having a hard time getting it started. We were all yelling at each other. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around music all my life because my father was a, a musician. So you I could have been a car designer. Well, I could have been, but I think I, I, I found my one true car. Yeah, I think he did all right. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Corvette Tahoe. Corvette? Yes. <laughs> How about, anybody ever kid you about your name? Uh, all the time in high school. And now your host, Barry McGuire. One of the largest and fastest growing segments of the car hobby today is the world of hot rodding, which is an amazing fact for those of us who are fortunate enough to witness and eventually join with that first generation of hot rodders more years back than I care to remember. We never dreamed that hot rodding would not only survive, but actually thrive into the 21st century. Today, we take a close look at hot rodding through the eyes of hot rod legend Alex Exidius, hot rod builder extraordinaire Pete Shaporis, Bruce Meyer, the head cheerleader for hot rodders, and musical giants Michael Anthony of Van Halen and Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top, all of whom have one thing in common. Every one of them is certified. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to McGuire's Car Crazy. We are here with my buddy Pete Shaporis, SoCal Speed Shop owner, hot rod restorer, builder, extraordinaire, all these kind of things you're doing. I was in, caught up in uh, kind of the tea bucket craze in Southern California in the middle 60s. And Jake was doing the same thing. We'd never met, he was on the other side of town. And through a mutual friend, um, Gray Baskerville got involved in this thing. So here I am working at Blair Speed Shop and Gray Baskerville walks up. He goes, hi, I'm Gray Baskerville. I'm with Broad and Custom Magazine. And we heard through the grapevine that you're building a CHOP 34-3 window. And I go, yeah. So who'd you hear that from? Bob Langton. By the end of the night, we're all sitting on my floor in my living room talking about how they're going to put these two cars on the cover of Rod and Custom Magazine. And basically, it started Jake's and mine's career together. But go back for a minute because the 34 that became known as, well you called it the kid, then the California kid for the movie, and yeah. it was driven by this young upstart who became president of the United the States. The president of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> Martin States. Sheen, yeah, Martin was, Sheen. The, was the kid that drove the California kid. And I remember they about thrice that car when you gave it to the studio. What was cool was is that I built the car for myself just to drive to the events and drive around town, drive back and forth to work. And I get this telephone call on Sunday afternoon. This fellow on the other end of the phone is Howie Horowitz. And he says, you still got that car? I go, yeah. He says, could you bring it down to Universal on Monday? We're, we'd like to take a look at it for using it in a film. So we take the car down there on Monday and we meet with all the people and the director comes out and says, that's the car, just leave it here. They sent us home in a limo. I had my contract signed and it changed our history forever. It changed my life forever. I, I, uh, amazing what's taken place in your life. Yes, it is. I was sitting up in my office on this property when we first moved over here, and the company was called the Peach Chaporis Group. Well, you can't hardly say that without stumbling, and Peach was a nickname that I got, because Peach Chaporis, what kind of name is Peach, you know? <laughs> I didn't like it. I couldn't even, and we're really, we're pretty inventive guys, and I couldn't even get a decent t-shirt out of it, right? I, I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to do? And so I look over, and there's the belly tank model sitting there. I wonder if Alex was smart enough to keep that alive all these years. So I called him on the phone. He says, Alex. I says, you still got the SoCal name? And he goes, yeah. I said, you got it. It's all up to date. Yeah. I said, well, I got a deal for you. And I said, I'd like to resurrect the SoCal speed shop. I need a boost. I mean, I've got plenty of business, but we need to get into some more stuff here, just more than building cars. He didn't even take a breath. He goes, I'm in. Just like that. Let's go back a little bit and talk about Alex. I mean, one, talk about personalities in the hobby. I mean, we have some that are just legends, and Alex is one of those. Alex um, came out of, the, out of World War II in 1946, and he had been literally thinking 
uh, for years about what he could do when he got out. And, and he borrowed some money, like let's say on a Wednesday, and on Thursday he had rented a building the day after he got out of the service and started the SoCal Speech Shop. When we come back, we'll talk to one of the biggest hot rodders around, the founder of the SoCal Speed Shop, Alex Exidius. So stay tuned, we'll be right back, right here on Car Crazy! Car Crazy! Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy in our tribute to some of the world's top hot rodders. And now thanks to our buddy Pete Shapouris, the fame and reputation of the SoCal Speed Shop gets even bigger. It really is, and it's so much fun for me because I don't have to go down and weld or do anything like that. I just can go down and be the hero founder. Uh, I've got an interesting story on that, Barry. When Pete and I did our first show after SoCal came back to life, it was in Portland, the Portland Roaster Show, which is a, a big show up there. And Pete printed up some uh, posters with the belly tank on and I was supposed to sign them for people up there. Well on the way up there I'm thinking what if nobody even comes up and asks for an autograph because you know it's been 40, 50 years since I'd done anything like that and I'm sure Pete was thinking what if nobody asked him for an autograph. <laughs> so we get there and we set this little table up and we have a booth and everything and boy I'm nervous and Pete's nervous. Then some people start coming up and I started signing them and they started talking about SoCal. One guy came up with a Hot Rod magazine wanted me to sign that and boy those were the good old days and stuff. The show ran from Thursday to Sunday. Saturday afternoon we were out of posters. I had signed 700 in Portland, Oregon. How did that make you feel? <laughs> it was flabbergasting. <laughs> I've never gotten over it. Obviously, I yeah, told you the story. Yeah, yeah. I've never gotten over it. I mean, and, I, and we've done that at every show. People remember that little shop. It's just amazing. Talk about your first time going to Bonneville. Well, the first time at the lakes was with the little belly tank with the V860 in it, and, and I was very, very, very nervous. You must have been. And yeah, I was having a hard time getting it started. And <laughs> we, we were all yelling at each other, and, do this, <laughs> Pressure's do on that. now, oh, pressure's on. Yeah. It, <laughs> We were just a bunch of young kids, and uh, but once that first meet was over, from then on, uh, we enjoyed it, and it was fun. And in those days, on a record run, you had to go both directions. So coming back to get the longest run we could, we'd go way down into the boondocks. It was fairly dangerous, but you needed that extra room. But then Bonneville came along. That was the ultimate. Boy, we got so excited when we found out we were going to Bonneville in 1949. And that's when we decided to build a special car for it. Rather than run the belly tank, uh, Dean Batchelor, my pal, uh, came in with some auto union wind tunnel tests from a, in a book that he had. So we saw that uh, this auto union wind tunnel test, they increased the frontal area of the car by 50% in closing their Grand Prix car, but they reduced the drag by half. So we built a full, fully enclosed car. What was your time, you remember, that first, first time out? Yeah, it uh, went uh, 193 miles an hour. Man. The lakes record was 160. <laughs> we were just staggered. I mean, we had absolutely no idea. We knew we had a good idea, but how much it would help. What year was this now? 1949. Oh, 1949. So our name's on that Hot Rod Magazine trophy the first two years, fastest time in Bonneville. We're very proud of that. There's more car crazy to come in our tribute to Hot Rod Legends. Later, we'll go car hopping across America and around the world and visit with the next generation of car guys. So stay tuned. It's right here on Car Crazy. Hey, hey, Barry, my ride is so sweet. Hop on over and talk to me. We're here with two certified car crazies, Brad Franchise and his partner in crime over here, a guy you probably will recognize his face, Michael Anthony, one of the founders of Van Halen. And uh, I mean, he's known for his music, but he's a serious car guy. And we're going to find right. out a little bit about which came came first. But that's a good place to start, Michael. What you know? I mean, I know you've been music all your life, but. Well, talk about this balance in your life. You have such passion for cars. I've been around music all my life because my father was a, a musician, so naturally that's how I fell into it. But ever since I was a kid in uh, elementary school, I would just be, like my friends and I, would be drawing pictures of cars, drawing pictures of dragsters and just anything like that. So You've I've been a car designer. Well, 
I could have been, but I think I, I, I found my one true client. Yeah, I think you did all right. <laughs> you didn't make too bad a choice. He has a share of input on yeah. our design cards. Yeah. Though, yeah, so. Brad, talk about your background for a second. Then we're going to talk about the, the real good stuff you're doing today. But. Uh, Mike and I, who have been friends for about 10, 11 years, we, uh, we said, what do we like? We like cars, we like boats, and we like watches. And so, what better combination, right? We, we came up with Bond Speed, and we manufacture our watches in Switzerland, and we do car design, we do our wheels, gauges, and then our apparel line. And so, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Ford asked us to take their new 2004 Ford F-150. So, we took and we, we kind of melded everything we do into this truck. Amazing. Yeah, it's, Amazing. It's a lot of fun. It's and uh, it just gets better and better. Congratulations, guys. Brad Branshaw and Michael Anthony. Did you ever find a cup so fine as mine? All right, now let's find out just how car crazy you are. What were the two engine sizes offered in the 1970 Ford Mustang Boss? Was it the 302 and the 429? The 250 and the 350? The 170 and the 290? or the 302 and the 428. Think you know it? Well, we'll find out your muscle car savviness a little later in the show. When we come back, we'll talk to hot rod extraordinaire Bruce Meyer, as well as Billy Gibbons from that little old band from Texas, ZZ Top. You don't want to miss this. It's right here on Car Crazy. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy and our tribute to hot rod legends. So then more than 40 years later, you and our buddy Bruce Meyer go out and find this car again. I'm having dinner with uh, Bruce at the hot rod reunion in Bakersfield and he says, boy, next I'd sure like to do that belly tank of yours. And I told him, well, I knew who had it, but uh, the guy thought he would restore it, even though he'd had it for 30 years and would never do it but he wouldn't sell it. Well, Bruce just, Bruce and I kept going and kept going and I went and list people to call him and finally one night he called and agreed to sell it. And we go in and he was gonna have the car down out of the rafters and everything. Well, it was still up in the rafters and stuff was piled on it and it was twisted. It had been sitting at an angle for years. The belly tank nose was gapped open. <laughs> I mean, it was in terrible shape. So I'm going, Oh, God, look at this car. What have they, oh, have they cut holes in the side for different exhaust systems oh, they'd run man. over the years? Oh, my goodness. I thought, no what respect. Have, <laughs> what have they done to this car? And little but no to me not being a car collector, Bruce is going, oh, my God, the whole car's here. You have done something I think is so very special, and that is this whole restoration thing and finding some of the really great cars from years past and restoring them and reuniting them with their with their previous owners. One of my most fun projects, Barry, was this belly tank that we did. And uh, I'd known Alex Exidius, and of course knew of the SoCal Speed Shop. And then to put him together with the tank, and of course when we took it out, he looked at the tank, he said, oh my gosh, that's in terrible shape. And I looked at it, and my gosh, it's all there. It's, it's, it's original, yeah. you know? And Alex is original. <laughs> so, is he ever. Oh, is he ever. <laughs> And again, it's putting the people together with the cars and then sharing it. And we take it to the Peters, and that's where that car resides now. And the whole hot rod culture is, was a very underappreciated part of the hobby. So it's, it's fun now, you know, bringing out this whole hot rodding, you know, movement. The price of hot rods today. Oh, yeah. And you say, why did this happen? And you and Bruce are a big reason that happened. Yeah. So we have this hot rod class at Pebble. The Doan Spencer, your hot rod, yeah. Bruce owns it, wins the gold, right. wins the class. And at that point forward, every heavyweight collector around, that was the car they really yeah. wanted anyway. They thought they couldn't go there, but all of a sudden it was a Pebble Beach winner. Now they could have the car they really wanted. If you ask them if they have a hot rod in their collection, which car they drive most, it's always the hot rod. Yeah. Car crazy. Then there's a picture of Otis Chandler and I when we did the uh, Sturgis rally together, Carol Shelby. And uh, I'll tell you another great, great car memories. guy is uh, Dwight Yoakam and Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. And they come by when they're in town. It's great fun having them in here. Yeah. What was your first car? My dad uh, sprang for a uh, little slant six Dodge Dart, believe it or not. <laughs> Fortunately, it was a two-door, so we had that going. But uh, that car was, uh, you know, it was one of those... Uh, Exciting first things, uh, a bit of an embarrassment at the time, uh, later to become quite a famous car. You hear it at the beginning 
of uh, one of our songs entitled Manic Mechanic. Oh, and that uh, has the distinction of the sound of our first car. Springing from that, there was uh, hot rod projects along the way. I think the 34 uh, Ford from the Eliminator album and certainly the ZZ Top videos really uh, connected this image to our real passion, which is cars. Billy Gibbons. I've known Billy Gibbons for 30 years. I, I came to, to my place at Pete and Jake's one afternoon and there was an album sitting up against my door by itself. And the corner had been clipped off of it and I knew it was a demo because I have a few people in the music business and I know what it was, but there was no note or anything with it and it was a ZZ Top album. So about four or five months later, this fella comes walking across the parking lot with a, with a lady on each arm. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, my God, that's Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. It's fairly easily recognizable. <laughs> yeah. So he comes walking up, pulls his glasses down. He goes, he goes you, never, you never wrote me back. And I said, I didn't know I was supposed to. He says, I had an album delivered to your place with a letter on it. And I said, well, the album got there, but the letter didn't. And he goes, you're kidding. And I go, no. He says, are you going to be around tomorrow? And I go, yeah, I'm here for three days. He says, well, so am I. He says, we just played Knoxville, Tennessee. He says, and I'm here for the weekend. He says, so I'll come over tomorrow and talk to you. And you're going, yeah, right. You know, came back. We started working on his car, which was basically the red coupe that went into the trilogy MT. I mean, it took a long time to get it going. He says, I just want the California kid, only I want it red. Red, red. Another icon of the hobby. So what's at the core of all this? Why is the car hobby exploding? I think that people are looking for something maybe that's just a little simpler. I mean, that roadster behind you there is, there's no heater, there's no air conditioning, there's no radio in that car. I think it's just a simpler way of, of doing things. I'm, I'm, I'm 61 years old, and when I get in my hot rod, I look through the world with 17-year-old eyes. When we come back, we'll find out what two engine sizes were offered in the 1970 Mustang Boss. I'm Mike Kennedy from Irvine, California, and you're watching Car Crazy right now on Speed. Yeah! Car Crazy! So, what were the two engine sizes offered in the 1970 Mustang Boss? Originally, it was built to be professionally raced, and the Mustang Boss was offered with either a 302 or a 429 cubic inch engine in 1970. The Boss 429 was originally built for NASCAR and sold for $5,100, while the Boss 302 came in for a very reasonable $4,100. <laughs> I think you'd pay a little more for one of those today. And frankly, if you knew this obscure your bit of car trivia? You must be car crazy. Just when we thought the car hobby might lose the next generation to computers and video games, an entirely new genre of car guys has exploded onto the scene. Listen to what next generation car guys have to say. Hi, what's your name? Corvette Tahoe. Corvette? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> President of the Flux team. What do you look for in a person to be a part uh, of your Something, team? someone more outgoing. Willing to uh, try different things on their cars. Personal character and integrity have anything to do with it? A lot, a lot to do with it. They, <laughs> they would have to be able to get along with the rest of the team as well. You put an enormous amount of time into these cars, into this team. We all have our day jobs, we all have our school. This is something we do for fun as a group. Uh, how did you get into this tuner hobby? Um, my dad, he's really been into cars. He made me after a car. That's how it came along. I just ended up liking cars as it is. So your dad did that on purpose for you? Probably. Little did he know when he named your Corvette that you'd be heading up a, a whole team, one of the most successful teams in the team. Oh yeah, I, I don't think he ever uh, thought about that, but yeah, I'm the president, we're doing it big right here. How much of the week is spent on cars and, and, and Team Flux? Basically most of my time. Um, all weekdays, uh, Monday to Friday, I do stuff for the team, pick up awards, um, contact people, and work on weekends. Your full-time job is Team Flux. Your part-time job is selling real estate on the weekend. Exactly. Weekends. That's basically what it adds up to. Well, congratulations. You're a great job. Thank You're a great you. role model for everybody. Thank you. And now, once again, Barry McGuire. One of the purposes of this uh, show is to entice a lot of you to move from being spectators to actually being participants in the car hobby. I, I call it creeping car craziness because if we can just get you started, it's amazing. It just has a way of uh, becoming a larger and larger part of your life. And 
We have a wonderful letter from Bob in Pennsylvania who bears witness to that fact. Listen to what he has to say. I originally purchased my 1974 Corvette in 1987 when I lived in Denver, Colorado. I always wanted a vet, so I picked it up for my 40th birthday as a driver. I started to have brake problems in 1996 and decided to get her fixed up to sell. I hooked up with a local club and found a, a weekend vet mechanic. The brakes were fixed and I started to run with him and a small group of folks from the club. The first summer we went to shows and I parked in the back with my hood down. The following winter we rebuilt the motor, detailed under the hood and freshened up the interior and carpet and trim and seats. The following summer I drove her more, had my hood up at shows and cruises and picked up a few trophies. In the summer of 2000 we went to Corvettes at Carlisle and I saw the beginning of the now popular craze of putting C4 suspensions under older vets. I was hooked. Everyone seemed to be doing it to C1s and C2s and that was it. I wanted to do it to my C3. Cost was an issue, but I was determined to figure out a way to build a quality 7C4. In the fall of 01, I took early retirement from a company that I'd worked for for 33 years. In November, I started working on the car alone for at least eight hours each day during the week. And with my mechanic on weekends, I was in heaven, having fun, building a project car to the magnitude I'd never thought I would have the opportunity to do in my life. In May of 02, she was finished. I can't stop smiling when I turn the key on and just take it through its gears. I very much enjoy driving and showing the car and explain the effort to others with interest. I didn't realize the magnitude of the effort and money when I began, but I don't regret any of it. During the spring, summer, and fall of 02 and 03, I clocked over 6,000 miles on her and managed to collect 16 first place trophies in one second in regional Corvette shows for everything from best in class, modified C3, best interior twice, best paint. I ended up with the best of both worlds. Looks old and drives new. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. It is a great testimony to creeping car craziness. It is a hobby that, uh, quite frankly, you can't just be a little bit pregnant. I want to encourage you to kind of stick your toe in the water, but as soon as you do that, I got to tell you, you're just going to want to jump in and and swim and enjoy the whole experience with all of the rest of us. And uh, we hope to help you do that with this show each week. So come on back next week and watch the next edition of McGuire's Car Crazy. Car Crazy has been brought to you by McGuire's. Serious car care for car crazy people. If you're car crazy or know someone who is, Send your car crazy comments or confessions to carcrazycentral.com.